And everybody said, yeah. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you, Lord, for the word, the revelation of your mind that you have given to the world as well as to the church. We're asking, Lord, that this study will make a backbone as Christians very firm, very strong in Jesus' name. Lord, that will not be hearers of the word only, will be doers of the word in Jesus' name. That, Lord, our Christian experiences will remain intact. Salvation by grace, sanctification of the heart, of the spirit, of the mind, and the power in the baptism in the Holy Ghost reaffirmed in every life in Jesus' name that born of the Spirit will walk in the Spirit, will live in the Spirit, will labor in the Spirit, and everything we do will be according to the empowerment of the Spirit of God in our lives in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, not to just come to the Bible study as people usually come, but that the word will make a definite impact in every life. Confirm it, Lord. Bless us, Lord, and use us to go and reveal your mind, your will, the gospel to all the people. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Once again, another amen. God bless you. You can see that today we're coming to Galatians chapter 5. I was studying from verse 22 all through to verse 26. Please open your Bible. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, 23, meekness, temperance, against such, there is no law. In verse 24 it says, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with their affections and laws. 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the spirit and then in verse 26 it says let us not be desirous of vain glory provoking one another envying one another those are the verses we're looking at tonight and the topic is the fruit of the spirit in kingdom citizens those who become citizens of the kingdom and they live like children of God, like citizens in that kingdom. Christ's kingdom, God's kingdom, the eternal kingdom, and the kingdom of the Son that shows the life of the children of God, the fruit of the Spirit in kingdom citizens. We're dividing the passage to three parts. Number one, cultivating the fruit of love by the Spirit. Number two, crucifying the flesh to live in the Spirit. And number three, considering other followers not living in strife. Come to number one. Number one, cultivating the fruit of love by the Spirit, cultivating the fruit. When you plant, the seed brings forth, germinates, and then eventually we have fruit. And we do that by cultivation. You have to uh, kind of uh, plow the field, plant the seed, and then by watering, by taking care, you cultivate and the fruit will come. The same thing with the Christian life. The Christian life is not just like an automatic thing. I'm born again, I'm born again, and we do nothing. We plow the field. 
we sow the seed, we read the word, we embrace the word, and we pray to have grace, the grace of God in our lives, to live by the word we have heard, and then we bring the fruit that is uh, like the tree that has been planted, and then the fruit will show. And now the Bible tells us it's not the fruit of the man, it's not the fruit of self-effort, it's not the fruit of self-righteousness, it's because of the presence of grace in our lives, we now have the fruit of love by the Spirit. Look at three things here. Number one, we're looking at bearing the Spirit's fruit, love, joy, and peace. Number two, building the saints' fellowship long-suffering gentleness and goodness number three behaving with steadfast faithfulness there's faith there's meekness there's temperance which is self-control look at number one bearing the spirit's fruit love joy and peace as we become born again, it's the Spirit of God that bears witness with our hearts that we're children of God. He leads us to repentance, the Spirit. He leads us to confession, the Spirit. He leads us to conviction, is the Spirit. And it's the one that leads us to conversion, is the power of the grace that comes through Christ by the Spirit revealed unto us. That's what brings us to the new life in Christ. And as the Spirit is resident within us, living within us, that Spirit begins to bear the fruit of love and joy and peace look at galatians chapter 5 verse 22 it says the fruit of the spirit is love joy and peace in romans chapter 5 verse 5 romans chapter 5 verse 5 and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of god is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. It says, the love of God, not the natural love that people have, a mother to the children, natural. Not the natural love, parents to the children, natural. Not the natural love, friends to friends, nat natural. Not the natural love, uh, one tribe, uh, citizen to another tribal man or woman, natural. It's not the natural love, a man to a woman, to attract one another so they can get married. It says uh, the love of God, the love that originates from the heart of God, because God is love. And when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Spirit of God transfers that love of God, the nature of God, the attribute of God, the characteristic of God, which is love, transfers that into our hearts. We begin to feel that love towards God. And then we love God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. And we feel that love, sense that love towards the Lord Jesus Christ because we're constrained by the love that he had for us. He loved us so much, he went to the cross, and because of that, we reciprocate. And we're grateful. We say, see what he has done in his love. He gave his life that we might be saved. And we realize this is the love that closed the door, the gate of hell, and then opened the door of heaven, that love of God to Christ. We now love him, we love him beyond anyone. And there is no rival to that love. It's the Spirit of God that keeps on reminding us of the love of God of the love of Christ and then love to the church the love we have to those who have received the same 
precious faith as we are, the children of God, you are born again and born again and we are born again by the same sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ how we love one another as members of the family of God like the members of the same human family like they love one another he is a child of God I'm a child of God he is born again I am born again we're traveling as pilgrims to the same destination heaven because of that we have love one to the other is this by it says by this shall all men know that she are my disciples if he have love one towards and know them and then we love mankind Jesus died for them they are so precious to God that Jesus the son of God had to die for them therefore we love humanity we love the people and we show our love by giving them the gospel we show our love by giving them or to take them away from Satan, from sin, from society, from darkness, and get them to heaven. And we now even love our enemies. We're looking at Christ like children look at their parents, and whatever the parents do, whatever the parents say, however the parents act, the children want to act like their parents. We're looking at Jesus Christ, and we're looking at his attitude towards his enemies, at the people who crucified him, at the people who persecuted him, and he said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And we say, I'm so happy and privileged I'm a child of God I'm so happy and privileged that as my Savior did as my Savior said I can say the same thing also like that little child is walking like the father like that little girl walking like the mother and says mommy look at me I am walking like you like that boy will put the feet into the shoes of the parents and try to drag and try to move and they say daddy daddy look at me I am wearing your shoe the same way when we're children of God we're so happy that we can follow after the precepts of the Lord and we say Lord I thank you you prayed for your enemies because of your love and you said father forgive them for they know not what they do I am saying the same thing I'm acting the same way and I'm praying for my enemies is because the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts not in our head not in our mind is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost the Holy Ghost the Holy Spirit is at work and is uh, supervising and is uh, generating and is bringing forth that love every day the Holy Ghost himself making the love to come visible and to come in a practical way because it is given unto us not only love but joy look at uh, Romans chapter 14 I'm reading from verse 17 for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink the kingdom of God is not festival or festivities. The kingdom of God is not eating during Christmas, eating or not eating during Easter. We remember Christ died and then we remember when Christ was born and then we're eating and feasting. It says, no, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Joy in the Holy Ghost. Not joy in the flesh. Not joy in alcohol. Not joy in wine. Not joy in drinking. Not joy in celebration. It's talking about the joy in the heart. Salvation has come. And you have 
they are there, they are understanding that the Holy Ghost is telling you your name is written in the book of life in heaven. What joy you have. All your sins have been forgiven. Everything you ever did in your life, those terrible things and those shameful things that would have landed you in hellfire forever and ever. And just at one strike, Jesus Christ, by his blood, washed away everything and no sin is remembered against you anymore. And no sin is to your account anymore. And you're free as if you had never sinned in your life. And the Holy Spirit telling you that even Jesus now, Christ, is at the right hand of God, is interceding for you. And he makes your path and your way pleasant. And you say, I of all people, a sinner just a few years ago now a saint of God and then you look towards heaven there's no condemnation now to those who walk in the spirit who live in the spirit what joy you have in your heart and Jesus even rejoiced and said father I thank you and I rejoice because you have hidden these things from the high and the, the, the great men of the world and you have revealed them unto babes for so it seemed right and good in your sight the joy that you have that you can even cause the heart of Jesus to rejoice is the fruit of the spirit and it is in bearing that that you go around not with a gloomy face a drawn face a long face it's like you know some people the whole of the world is on their back not that you're cheerful you're happy you think of whatever you are going through today and you say that the reward coming is nothing to be compared with the grace I have, the position I have, the privilege I have, the reward I'm going to have in heaven. And so your heart is full of the joy of the Lord. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. We're looking at verse 1. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Then in verse 2, it says, And with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering and forbearing one another in love. In verse 3, it tells us, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Peace in your heart. Deep peace, like the depth of a river. Deep peace, overflowing peace, the peace that passes understanding, the peace that passes any measurement by any instrument in the world, the calm in your soul, the serenity in your spirit, and the peace in your personality. You are not ruffled, you are not bothered, you are not, uh, you know, blown here and there there's the deep peace of God because your sins are gone because the things that cause commotion and confusion and conflict in the heart all that is gone and because of that peace you know the prince of peace reigns in your heart and the God of peace abides with you if anything is happening in the world you have that confidence is by my side is mine and nothing external ruffles you nothing external jolts you whatever people do you know if they only could understand the connection you have with the heavenly father and you are at peace every time if there's any need you are at peace you know god is going to supply if there is any kind of persecution and conflict is thrown at you you know god is in charge that he will not allow that persecution that problem to go beyond what you can handle that gives you peace so you have the love you have the joy and you have the peace and you are bearing that fruit of the spirit in every area of your life whatever comes whatever goes it's always there i pray that fruit will abide in your life abide in your family amen 
abide in your place of work and everywhere you go you are going with the understanding the spirit abides the spirit remains and because of that love joy peace abide forever in your life in jesus name look at number two there number two there is the building building the saints fellowship with long suffering and gentleness and goodness as you become born again a child of god you're not living in isolation you're living with other children of god you're joining with other children of God. You're on pilgrimage to heaven with other children of God. And because you're with other children of God, you're conscious of that. These children of God you are living with, some of them may not know everything you know. These children of God you are living with, some of them may not have the deep understanding of love like you have. There are differences in our knowledge and differences in our understanding and differences in our approach to things in life. Therefore, some of them will do something ignorantly because you have better knowledge greater knowledge you say but that's not right how could you do that some of the people that you know on pilgrimage with you were going to heaven they're slow in their walking with god they are kind of almost retarding you bringing you back because they don't have the same Christian experience, the same self-denial, and the same strength and power like you have. Therefore, you'll find differences. That is why. As you remain in fellowship and you don't say, I don't care whether they are slow or fast, I don't care whether they are going down or going up, you want to build the fellowship. Of, with fellow believers, fellow pilgrims, fellow citizens. And because of the differences you have, you'll need long suffering. You'll be patient for other people, and the Spirit of God will bring that up in your life. You will also need gentleness as other people. You know, the way they act, it's like if you were to act in your natural self, you'll pounce on them, you'll rebuke them, you will blow them up, you will say, What's the matter with you? Are you not born again? But now, because you have understanding that we are not all the same. In our understanding, in our experience, in our demonstration of our Christian life, you are gentle towards them. And because God has prospered you beyond and more than other people, what other people lack, you have. What other people do not possess, you possess. And so there is goodness coming from you to other people. In that way, people feel attached to you. You're building fellowship. You're building the faith of other people. You're building the confidence of other people. You're building the right attitude in other people. Building the saints fellowship through long suffering, gentleness, and goodness. Look at Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, and goodness. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, reading from verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, that's love, I am become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have 
have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, divine love, I am nothing. In verse 3 it tells us, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt and have not charity, it profited me nothing. Now look, look at verse 4. It says, charity the love of God in the heart of man, charity suffers long. Suffers long. Long suffering. It suffers long. It suffers the littleness of personality of other people. It suffers the misunderstanding of other people. It suffers the misapplication of the word of God by other people. It suffers the idiosyncrasies and peculiarities of other people. It's different. They are different. Their lifestyle, sometimes other people are thoughtless, but it suffers their thoughtlessness for a long time and he doesn't get angry he doesn't get bitter he doesn't get proud he's not pompous he's not haughty over them and calling them you know i want to tell you something that the way you act and the way you behave is because you are carnal and i am spiritual never never he never tells them that. You know, the way you are acting is because you are little in your understanding of the Bible, but I am magnanimous and great in my understanding of the Bible. He never says that. He allows people to save their face. He doesn't tell them anything, show them anything that will embarrass them. That, that's, that's the fruit of the Spirit. It's very conscious about how would they think if I do this? How would she think if I do this? They're very thoughtful every time. And even though the people show the littleness of their faith and the littleness of real Christian behavior and maturity, this person suffereth long and is kind. He remains kind. He doesn't allow what other people do, what other people say, how other people behave, how they react against him, how they rob him the other, the opposite direction, how they provoke him. He doesn't allow that to jolt him. He has long suffering charity suffered long and is kind charity envies not charity wanted not itself is not puffed up we're looking at james chapter 3 and we're looking at verse 17 james chapter 3 verse 17 but the wisdom that is from above is first pure then peaceable gentle gentle very gentle whatever is background you know uh, we, we people in the world we have different backgrounds backgrounds in your family backgrounds in my family backgrounds in training backgrounds in profession and some of the backgrounds we have it teaches us to be hard to be harsh and to bring it heavy on people and not to be not, not to be considerate and, and they, they teach us and they train us that in life this is the way to handle people and those people who depend on that kind of training they handle people as if those people are stone or stick and they have no feeling and they could be very hard and very harsh when we come to christ all that background all that training that wants to hurt other people that is not considerate of how they feel and how they think all that turns around that's why the bible says if any man be in christ it's a new creature old things are passed away and behold all things have become new 
harshness goes away. It becomes gentle because the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable and gentle, easy to be entreated, easy to live with. That his standard is not so high that nobody can live with him. He complains every time. And he's criticizing every time. And he's looking and something is wrong every time. Because of that, he has a boisterous kind of temper. And he has quick temper. Why this? Why this? Why that? But you know, when you have this grace of God in you, and the Spirit of God is resident within you. It gives you gentleness, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality and without hypocrisy. It says in verse 18, verse 18 says, And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them, that make peace. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're reading from verse 15. It says, See that none render evil for evil unto any man. The nature of the unregenerate man, the unsaved man, the nature of the natural man, natural woman that has not got the grace of God and has not got the fruit of the Spirit is teach for touch. He did that against me. Revenge, retaliation. I'll do this against him. She did that to me and I pleaded, please, forgive me. And she said, no, all right, no. When she comes, after she has cooled down, and she comes to me, I'll tell her no. That kind of attitude that doesn't have the goodness and the gentleness of Christ, what they manifest in the world, the harsh nature, the hard nature, the cruel nature. When we come to Christ, He takes that away from our lives. He says, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good. Ever follow that which is good. And you say, If everybody in the world were like me, there'll be no war, there'll be no conflict, there'll be no fighting, there'll be no violence, because that nature of violence has been taken away from me. And you want to spread that, you want other people to have that kind of nature by the Spirit of God. And it says you follow that which is good both among yourselves as Christians and among all men. We're coming to point, point number three here. Behaving with steadfast faithfulness, faith, meekness, and temperance. It tells us in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Verse 23, it says meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Uh, look at uh, Second Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 7. It says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith. Faith in God that everything will be all right. It appears that the road is rough. It will make plain 
the rough road. It appears that the conditions are difficult. It will simplify the conditions. It appears that we don't have enough to take care of body and soul. He'll provide. It appears that all things around us uh, looks like they are confusing and it's like there is not enough security. The Lord will protect his soul. We're walking by faith. And the fruit of the Spirit is faith. We never say anything as if God is no more there. As if God is not taking care of his own. As if God has gone on vacation and we cannot get his attention. We are walking by faith. He is here with me. He is there with you. He knows what you are going through. He remembers his promises that they shall call on me and I will answer them. They remember, we remember that he will see us through to the final end. I am with you until the end of the world. He remembers that God will not lie and God will not fail. For we'll walk by faith and not by sight. We'll see dazzling things around us. Confusing things around us. Things we cannot interpret. Things we cannot give reason for. Things will happen that will say, do you understand why that happened? No, I don't. Do you understand why this wind is blowing? No, I don't. Do you understand why the sun is hotter today than it was last time? No, I don't. Do you understand why the flood is much more this time than that? No, I don't. But we are not walking by what we see. We're not walking by sight, we're walking by faith. Titus chapter 3 verse 2. In Titus chapter 3 verse 2, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle showing all meekness unto all men. Showing all meekness unto all men. That's the nature of Christ. He says, I am meek and lowly, and ye shall find rest to your souls. Argument disturbs our rest. Conflict with people disturbs our rest. And discussions that get hot up, and then we're shivering and sweating, that disturbs our rest. But as we live with people, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. We argue about nothing. We fight about nothing. Because whatever is happening, as we remain meek, will inherit the earth. Whatever we need of the earth's prop property, and whatever we need in any time, we're going to inherit. Therefore, there's no force, there's no fighting, there's no violence, there's no argument, and there is, uh, there's no battle with anybody because it says we shall speak evil of no man and to be no brawlers, but gentle showing all meekness unto all men. And there's temperance in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 25. It says, and every man that striveth for mastery, striveth for mastery. Now he's not striving with other people. He is disciplining himself. Is developing himself. Is training himself so that I will be better today than I was yesterday. His competition is not with another man. His competition is not with another woman. His competition is with himself. I was slow yesterday. I'm going to be faster today. I was weak yesterday. I'm going to be strong today. I was inconsiderate yesterday. I'm going to be considerate today. I was powerless yesterday. I'm going to be powerful today. He's striving. He's training. is for himself. By himself to be faster today, higher today than he was yesterday. You are not competing with anybody. 
and you are not fighting with anybody. You just want to be a master in your calling today than you were yesterday. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. That's the temperance there. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are incorruptible. Verse 26, They have I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Look at verse 27, But I keep my body. My body is me. I'm not trying to keep another person, oppress them, suppress them, and clamp on them so that they will be what I want them to be. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? To control the life of another person, I want them to be like, no, it's me. It's me that needs that self-denial. It's me that needs that self-control. It's me that needs that temperance. It says, but I keep my body under and bring it, my body, not another person, into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself shall not be a castaway. You will not be a castaway. I said you will not be a castaway. Work on yourself. Work on yourself. Hey, don't bother about working on other people and try to make them fit into this jacket. Work on yourself. And make sure that you are better today than your word. Yes, it is. We're coming to point number two here. Number two is crucifying the flesh to live in the spirit so that the flesh will not trace up its ugly head against the spirit, against the Holy Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, reading from verse 24, Galatians chapter 5, we're looking at verse 24, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and laws. Then in verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Three things we're looking at. Number one, number one tells us crucifying the lusts of the flesh. Number two, conquering the affections of the flesh. Number three, confirming the life in the spirit number one number one crucifying the lusts of the flesh it tells us in first john chapter 2 verse 15 it says love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man love the world the love of the father is not in him have you ever noticed in your life whatever you love you nurse whatever you love you feed whatever you love your intimate ways and if you love anything that will hinder you from getting to the kingdom of god or getting to heaven you'll be nursing that thing because if you love it you nurse it and the more you nurse that thing the more it will grow. It's like somebody has a lion at present so small, so babyish that it cannot hurt. But if you nurse that baby lion by your own care, that baby lion will be growing and it will grow to the point your life is endangered the love of the world endangers our spiritual lives and if you love the world and nurse those things in the world a time comes when you become so attached that even when you want to get rid of it detach yourself from it you cannot you have nursed it 
so often. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man, any woman, any believer love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Look at verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. How will a child of God spend money, skill, resources, energy, spare time, free time, day, night, loving what is not of his father? Love means something which is not of her father. Think about it. Think about it. The things that Christ will not approve of. The things that the Spirit of God will not lead you into. The things that are just of the flesh and they are not of the father. And they do not help you to move on and progress in the things of the father. How will a child of God take what he had been given by God and be not seeing that thing and be growing in that thing. That will not be wise. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, and the world passeth away and the lost thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. Look at number two. Number two here, we're talking about conquering the affections of the flesh. Conquering the affections of the flesh. It tells us in Colossians chapter, chapter 3, we're reading from verse 5. Colossians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 5. Mortify, put to death. Get rid of your members which are upon the earth. What he's saying is, as you come from the world to the kingdom of God, come fully. Come fully. Don't leave your brain back in the world, your affection back in the world, your hands back in the world, your attachment back in the world come out of the world and come out clean and full that you know there is nothing in the world that is still attracting your attention it says mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth fornication uncleanness inordinate affection evil concupiscence and covetousness which is idolatry why look at verse 6 in verse 6 for which things sake the wrath of god cometh on the children of disobedience. The wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Look at it this way. You are supposed to be a child of God. And the love of God is supposed to be in your heart. And you are supposed to have come out of the midst of the people that are disobedient to God by nature, by character, by habit, and by practice. But you are with them as somebody is living in the midst of Sodom. He knows God is in Sodom. He says he loves God, but is in Sodom. He says he has the grace of God, but is in Sodom. And because the center of Sodom, in the midst of Sodom, resident in Sodom, the fire of judgment comes on everyone in Sodom. Although he says he's a child of God, because he lives there, he says there, he will not come out from there, and he lingers there. The fire that comes upon the children of disobedience come on him. And it says, for which things sake, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. You will not be among them. 
I will not be among them. Number three, look at number three here, confirming the life in the spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 25, if, he, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Our walk from day to day, our lifestyle from day to day, our practice from day to day, our understanding from day to day, our interactions from day to day, our devotions, our endeavor, everything we do from day to day, if we live in the spirit and the flesh has been subdued, and the flesh has no voice in our lives anymore. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. I pray the Lord confirm it in every life. We're looking at Romans chapter 8 verse 2. In Romans chapter 8 verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death, you remain free. I will remain free. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. And then in verse 13, in verse 13, for if we live after the flesh, if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. If ye Christians, ye believers, Ye, in verse 1, that has no condemnation because you are walking in, in the spirit but not after the flesh. Ye, who in verse 2, you have been made free by the law of the spirit of life. Ye, in verse 9, that has the spirit of God, of Christ, living in you. If ye so-called Christians, if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if through the Spirit ye mortify, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. You will live. Second Corinthians chapter 7, reading from verse 1. In Second Corinthians chapter 7, reading from verse 1, it says, have been there for these promises, Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The Lord will help everyone. The Lord will help me. The Lord will help me. And the life pleasing unto God you will have, you will demonstrate in Jesus' name. Point number three now. Point number three, considering other followers. Considering other pilgrims, other Christians, other children of God, not living in strife. Can you think about that? That you are a child of God and the Prince of Peace lives in your heart. How will you delight in strife, in fighting, in violence? What are you going to derive in that? A fish that is supposed to swim, how does he desire to fly? A bird that has the nature of the bird and flying. How will each decide and desire to plunge into the river and be swimming? A person who is the, in the kingdom of the Prince of Peace and he has the nature of the Prince of Peace and is called to walk in peace with one another. How will such a person desire to live in strife, in vainglory, in provocation. If somebody really has the peace of God and the nature of a peaceful believer, a peaceful, sanctified believer, 
how will he leave or she leave his territory her territory of peace and then go to live in strife our lives show what experience we have if we have the experience of peace with god and peace in ourselves and the spirit lives within us we'll consider other people and we we'll live with them at peace look at galatians chapter 5 verse 26 let us not be desirous of vain glory provoking one another envying one another in james chapter 3 verse 14 james chapter 3 reading from verse 14 but if ye have bitter envying and strive in your heart glory not and lie not against the truth if ye have bitter envying and strive in your heart the strife is not in the head the strife is not in the hand the hand will do nothing if the heart does not direct that hand the feet will do nothing to kick another fellow if the heart did not give directives to the feet and the mouth will not say anything all those members of the body the mouth the hands the feet they are at the under the control of the heart it is only when there is bitter envy and strife in the heart that the hand will do something violent that the mouth will say something unacceptable that's why it says but if he have bitter envy and strife in your hearts glory not and lie not against the truth verse 15 it says this wisdom descendeth not from above but is earthly sensual devilish it says actually instead of the holy spirit living in the heart abiding in the heart resident in the heart is the devil the author of strife, the author of violence, the author of confusion, for God is not the author of confusion, but the author of peace. If there is violence and if there is a strife coming from the heart, the devil is resident in that heart. And do you think that the devil and the Holy Spirit will live in the same heart? At the same time, when darkness is in, light is out. When light is in, darkness comes out. When the devil sits on the throne of the heart, the Holy Spirit will have to live. Is the gentle spirit like a dove, and it will not abide in the same house, the same habitation with the devil the old serpent this wisdom descendeth not from above but is earthly sensual devilish it tells us in verse 16 it says for where envy and strife is where envy and strife is there is confusion and every evil work verse 17 but the wisdom which is from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Verse 18, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of 
them that make them that make where there's no peace the people who belong to God they're eager to manufacture it they're, they're serious in making it in producing it uh, but if you're going to make something uh, you have to be interested in making it if you're a child of peace and you're a child of the kingdom of peace you'll be interested in making peace you will make the effort and you will do what you can do to make that peace. You desire, you are eager that peace will come. The peace in your heart will reflect outward, outwardly them that make peace. We're looking at three things here. Number one, the depravity of vain glory in hypocrites. Number two, the declare the desolation through provocation in the home. Number three, the delusion in envy in the heart. Look at number one. Number one is the depravity of vain glory in hypocrites. Uh, look at Philippians chapter 2 reading from verse 3. In Philippians chapter 2 verse 3, let nothing be done through strife of inglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. It says, let nothing be done through strife of the inglory. Why? Everything that is done in strife of being glory will not be recognized by God that it was done unto him. Anything that is done for strife of being glory will not have any reward from God. It may produce some humanly good results. If I didn't fight for that, I wouldn't have got that opportunity. If I didn't strive for that, they wouldn't have given me the chance. Well, they might give you the chance, the people who don't want trouble, the people that want to live at peace, the people who want to retain the peace of God in their hearts, they might say, let the property go. Let the opportunity go. Let that chance go. The man wants to have his way. The woman wants to have her way. And if she doesn't have her way, she'll bring the roof of the building down. Let the roof stay. Let her have her way. And then you'll say, if I really fight for that, will I get that? Maybe. But there'll be no recognition in heaven that you lived you behaved as a child of God. There'll be no reward from God that you did something for the progress of the kingdom of God. There'll be no record that you lived according to the desire of heaven. And it will show very clearly that you have no self-denial. You cannot bear any cross. You always want to bulldoze your way through. And you will not have a record that you are a child of God. Let nothing be done through strife of vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. I pray God will give us the grace to live the life of the Spirit in Jesus' name. Look at number two here. Number two, the desolation through provocation in the home. The desolation through provocation in the home. We're looking at Galatians chapter 5 verse 26. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, 
and being one another. This is applicable to every situation we find ourselves in life. Let's say, for example, husband and wife. You are lovely, you are loving, husband and wife. You are considerate of each other. You want children. And it is at the time when the woman can conceive every time that you have disagreement on flimsy things, irrelevant things, unimportant things. And that period when the woman can conceive is when there'll be, why did you put that there? Why did you put that there? And when you have stripe like that, there is no desire for intimate fellowship. And when that period is gone, now you're cheerful. Why was I angry the other time? Why did I, you know, fight with my wife that time? What came on me? And then you say, I won't do that anymore. And at then the following month, exactly the same time, when there is the possibility of reproduction and the possibility of having your prayer answered, it is at that time again there is the provoking of one another. This food, what kind of food is this? Who is going to eat this one? How did you serve this one? How did you burn that one? How did you, you know? And then when the time of reproduction is over, because you know the woman is not in that stage of reproduction every day of the month, every day of the year. And we allow unnecessary argument, unnecessary provocation to hinder us from enjoying our fellowship, enjoying intimacy, enjoying the marriage and the family the Lord has given us. I pray the devil will not cheat us anymore. Let the devil hear that. Amen. Amen. Let us not, husband and wife, isn't it good to wear a smile every time? Isn't it good to know that, you know, you are in this family and this family, there's love. In this family, there's joy. In this family, there is peace. In this family, there's long suffering. There's kindness. In this family, there is meekness. In this family, there is faith. In this family, there's temperance. And in this family, there is that walking together without any provocation. You know, if before you got married, you're always, you know, wearing your temper on your sleeves. Get angry, get provoked, and say this and say that. Now, after you've married, and that woman has come to your life, now, there must be a change. Maybe it was loneliness that was making you to have that kind of provocation in the past. It was, you know, being alone, no advisor, no companion, and nobody to, you know, be with you or enjoy life with you. And, you know, the, the needs were there, but now the Lord has favored you. Make that man happy. Provocation does not make us happy. Make that woman happy. Provocation does not make a woman happy. And then your life will be at peace. Your home will be at peace. There will be reproduction in your family in Jesus' name. There are things we cannot afford anytime. 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 We cannot afford anger bitterness, vainglory, provocation, envy, jealousy, anytime. Today, we'll bury everything here. And then we'll go back home and the fruit of the Spirit will be in every life in Jesus' name. We're coming to number three here. Number three here, the delusion in envy in the heart envy in the heart we're looking at romans chapter 13 and we're looking at verse 13 romans chapter 13 verse 13 it says let us walk honestly as in the day not in rioting and drunkenness now 
Christians don't take, don't drink alcohol. And the people who are drunken, they are drunken with alcohol. And the people who are into rioting and violence, they take their whatever hard drug so that they lose their senses. And now they can be violent and they forget the value of life. And they are ready to fight at any signal. But Christians don't take those hard drugs. Christians don't take the alcohol. But there are ideas that intoxicate us. Ideas of wanting to be on top of everybody, above everybody. Ideas that want to make us have our way. I am the king in this kingdom. I am the queen in this kingdom. I am the decision maker. And if I say there will be no peace, then there's no peace. That thing intoxicates people. And it intoxicates people like alcohol and like those hard drugs. And it says, remove those ideas. Live a peaceful life. A peaceful life will be a long life. All these things, they cut short our lives. Bad temper, angry temper, violence, and thinking evil. Our system our body is so created in such a way that if it's peaceful and it's running seamlessly, then we have long life, long support from the Lord, and we have the peace that produces a good life for ourselves, our own sake. For ourselves, our own progress. For ourselves, our own health. For ourselves, for a long, profitable, peaceful, useful life. All these things must leave our heart. I missed an amen. amen. All the things like I must have my way. My brother, okay, if you have your way, what's the gain? If you're bitter, you're violent, you don't have peace, and the Spirit of God does not trust you to abide in you all the time, what's your gain? If you have that kind of hot temper and you increase your blood pressure, what's your gain? If your blood pressure goes up systematically, and you use drugs, you calm it down, but the habit of that inner, inner violence provocation is still there, and the blood pressure shoots up suddenly. What's your gain? If the consequences of the blood pressure, high blood pressure, takes over your life, and it comes also with diabetes, blood sugar in the blood, What's your gain? If you destroy yourself by your own temper and you cannot live a life that is peaceful and serene and healthy, what is your gain? That's why those experts who study the body, they say we are our worst enemies. We injure ourselves. We destroy ourselves. The Lord has created us to have the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, and the meekness. He wants us to have the faith and the fidelity. And just to, not, not to worry about all these things that happen all around us. He wants us to have the temperance, temperance and self-control. The people say something, they do something, and you can remain on your path, and you can be making progress, and there's no anger. And you see that they cannot jolt you, they cannot disturb you, and your life is going on pleasantly. And you're enjoying your Christian life, and you're enjoying 
a good life. Then they'll come to you and say, what's your secret? And of course, you'll be healthy, you'll be sound, you'll be holy, you'll be happy. And if Christ comes any time, you don't have to say, Lord, wait for me. I need to confess something. Wait for me. I want to make right something. Your life is straightforward and peaceful and pure. I pray God will give you that kind of life. Health will be stable in your life. The power of God will be working in your life every time. The fruit of the Spirit. You have some fruit, you can have more. You have that fruit already. It can increase and it can also blossom and it can become more ripe. Tonight is your night to make progress. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. I want this peace. I want this joy. I want this love. I want all this fruit to increase in my life and to show every time, everywhere, in church, at home, in the office, in your profession, in your community, just have the fruit of the Spirit developing in your life. And a good life and the result of such a life will be visible in your life. You'll never miss, you'll not miss the promises of God in your life in Jesus' name.